Well, I'd like you to look here at that text that Charles read to you in Galatians chapter 5. We're not going to be talking about a lot of theology this uh, morning. We're going to talk about sin. Isn't that great? Lock the doors. All right. Yeah. They asked Calvin Coolidge, what did he preach on? He said, sin. What did he say about it? He was again it. And that's why and there's not, a, we're just talking about right and wrong. Uh, Galatians 1 through 4 was your great doctrinal section of Galatians setting out for you the theory and the biblical setting forth that men are not saved through their own works, but through faith alone in Jesus Christ. And now the question comes up, what does the life look like of someone who is saved by faith alone? Uh, and Paul showed you in verse 2 down through verse 12 of chapter 5 that the, the Christian life is not one of legalism, of keeping Jewish law. We're not incorporated into Israel when we become Christians. And it is not in verse 13. It's not license. Don't turn your uh, uh, faith into an opportunity for the flesh. Because I am saved and can't lose it, therefore I can do anything that I want to do. And Paul says, no, it's not legalism, it's not license, it is life and love. And so he talks about the, 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 the Christian life, the rebirth, what it looks like is that it's not that we get to do what we want, that by the grace of God, we get to do what we should. That God gives us the law of God on our heart, and we are now free to a life that we never lived before. And that that life, he's going to say in the rest of chapter 5, comes by the Holy Spirit of God. That there is a, an extraterrestrial that comes into your life. Something outside of your understanding. Anytime you're going to say that a person is saved by faith and can't lose it, you're going to, to keep that from becoming antinomianism. No law. You're going to have to have the constitutional change of the believer where he now desires and wants the affections that are set upon God. And that's exactly what the rebirth is. And so from, from verse uh, 13 and on, he talks about living by the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, in chapter 6, bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. And so, what the Christian life is, it is, that it is the grace of God to live a life that we no longer, not only didn't live and couldn't live, it was a life that we did not desire to live. That's the Christian life. Let me, let me clarify. Uh, some of you have had questions on this. When you say you're free from law, what does that mean? Whenever the Bible talks about law, it can be talking about capital L law, the Jewish law, or it can be talking about little l just the moral character of God, the law of conscience, the law of right and wrong. Whenever it says we're free from law, that is talking about capital L, the Jewish law. The Jewish law was ceremonial, it was hygienic, it was civil, and it was moral. Those are the four aspects of Jewish law. The ceremonial law was the sacrificial system to show you that you don't come to God on your own. You come by faith and one that intercedes for you in the shedding of blood. And that ceremonial law was looking forward to the ultimate Lamb of God who would die. And when he did, now the veil was torn and the Old Testament temple was now obsolete. And it ushered our way into the life of grace. Behold the Lamb of God that bore away the sin of the world. And so ceremonial law is ended because of its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. We now have a true high priest and a true sacrifice that represents us before God. And hygienic law, you were to have clean diet, clean bodies, clean clothes, and a clean home. That's why there were no freshmen in Israel, all right? That's a joke. You had, you, you had to be clean, and it was in and of itself, it was not a, a, a salvific thing. It was on the outside of you, but it was a shadow of Christ that God's people are to be clean in their hearts, their lives, and in their appearance, and in their homes, in their, in their, uh, in their bodies, that they're to be clean. And so that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, that when we trust in him, 
we become sanctified in him. We become what we're called saints of God. You know that, that in the New Testament, there's never a person called a saint. Never one person. All Christians are called the saints. That we're the holy ones. That's the life that he gives us. And so hygienic law is fulfilled in Christ. So if you're from Louisiana, eat whatever you want to. All right. You don't have to worry. You'll get to heaven quicker, as a matter of fact, than most of us. <laughs> Civil law in Israel, they were, a, they were a theocratic government. We are a spiritual body ruled by our king. Israel was a theocratic government. And so they put people to death for things. The capital punishment. Uh, they would give people stripes for things. Uh, 40 less one, 39 stripes that is in the Bible. Uh, we don't do that. We have principles of holiness that come from it, but we do not beat people, nor do we stone people. Can I get an amen out of that? Aren't you glad? You'd have to have a stoning committee and that would be a, a bad deal. And so we're free from ceremonial law, hygienic law completed in Christ and from a, a theocratic governmental system. We're ruled by the morality of God. But as far as moral law, it too is fulfilled in Christ. It's not simply by a group of moral laws that we try to keep, but it is by the law of God that is put on our heart. Jeremiah 31, I'll write my law in their heart and on their minds I will, I will place it and I will be their God and they will be my people. I'm going to make them have a heart to obey me. I'm going to make them new creations. And so we don't have a big list of rules that we keep. We simply have the law of Christ. We become like him. And we love a greater commandment that I give to you, a new commandment, love one another. And if you'll do this, all of the laws that lead up to it will be fulfilled. And so in that sense, we are not under rules because we uh, fulfill the law of God simply by placing our eyes upon him. That's all that we need. And thus, when the child of God, now hang to this, whenever he reads the moral law of the Old Testament, whenever he reads the New Testament commands, they're not things that are a burden on him. They are his delight because they explain what loving God and loving your neighbor mean. For instance, when you go home, take Leviticus 18 and read about the moral law of God. When you come into the land, you will not do like the people of the land or like the Egyptians you left. You will be like me. I am holy for you shall be holy. You shall, and then it goes down as to what we're supposed to be morally. And when you read that, it's just bracing to our souls. This is what God would have me be. And so it's not a burden, it's a delight, and it's the defining of what obedience really is. So when the New Testament gives you attributes or, or commands, they are all, it's like if you took love thy neighbor as yourself and dropped it and it hit and spread out into crystals and shards, each of them having a, a reflection. The, the law of loving God and loving your neighbor, when you drop it and it shatters, you can look at the individual commands as to what leads up to that. One time, uh, the house next to us, when we used to live on Malone Street, they had a, a, uh, a couple of, of uh, Labradors. And one day they got out and they were running around in the front yard. And I grabbed Benjamin and I said, let's go get those dogs and put them back in. And he said, why? Good question. <laughs> we went and got them and put them back in. And I said, you know why we did that? Because that's our neighbor and we love our neighbor. And the Old Testament says, if you see your animals or your uh, neighbor's animal wandering, you will not harden your heart. You will go get that animal and put him back in. How many have ever been driving in East Texas and seen a cow out of the pen? Uh, if you possibly can, you stop and go, yo, your cow's loose. All right. Well, if you love God, that's what you're going to do. But I said, we're going to do that because the Bible very specifically tells you that's what the love of God. Ain't that something? And so it's the defining of obedience. Are you with me? Um, are there, is there a possibility for a Christian to be legalistic? Yes, there is. 
There is hardcore legalism, there is hard shell legalism, and there's hard heart legalism. And let me just define those. And if you're guilty of these, I want you to stand up. Okay, <laughs> kidding. Hardcore legalism is the idea that I'm, I'm saved today because I'm doing what I think is okay. But if I really do something evil, I've lost my salvation. So I better get back to church and confess it real quick so I can get back in. You've heard of tulip Calvinism. This is called Daisy Arminianism. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. And it'll make you crazy. Uh, we have at Denton Bible a specific discipleship uh, track that we take when we get somebody that is from that mindset. When they grew up thinking that I'm saved for now, but if I mess up tomorrow, I'm lost, and then I can come back, and you're always in and out of God's grace, that'll make you neurotic. And the problem is you'll slowly lower the holiness of God to fit your own life. It's not that you're not able to keep the, the rules, it's that you think you will because you lower God. And so it'll make you either neurotic or it'll make you arrogant. And so that's called hard core legalism. God loves me if I do this stuff. Number two is called hard shell. That's where you dogmatize non-biblical areas. That if you're truly a, I heard a pastor once say, or it was said about him that he said, if you love the church, you'll come Sunday morning. If you love the pastor, you'll come Sunday night. If you love God, you'll come Wednesday. He should have been shot for saying that. That's horrible that, that you've got these, these non-biblical ideas that if you're really a woman who loves God, you will not wear pants, all right? You'll wear a dress. If you really love God, that you will let your hair grow to your heels and put it up in a knot on your head. Scissors are evil, all right? That if you are a man that really loves God, you will not have hair. First service, I said hair on your ears, and that's not really true because all men have hair on their ears. It's hair down over their ears, all right? You've got a, I knew of a church up north that had a barber in the church, and when you got saved, if your hair was too long, they would take it off. Nothing will make you crazier than that right there. Uh, if you're really a Christian, you don't listen to music with a beat. Okay. You just hum to the glory of God. And on and on and on to where you are now canonizing non-biblical things. And then the other kind is called hard heart. And that is where you are proud of your moral obedience. I thank thee, O oh God, that I am not like other men. I pray, I fast, I tithe of all that I get. Thank you that I'm not like this, Democrat, uh, this, this publican over here. That's not the way it's supposed to be, all right? That we never come to the plate. We always want to be thinking, there but by the grace of God go I. And I, like Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. And so you never get proud of anything except the grace of God. Now that's, that's New Testament legalism. So with that in mind, let's all suffer together and looking at what the text says about biblical and non-biblical life styles. In verse 19, this is what Christians are not supposed to do. Verse 19, the deeds of the flesh are obvious. They're self-evident. Immorality, impurity, sensuality. The first thing you hit is fornication, literally. Sexual immorality that is an impure thing and leads to sexuality being nothing but sensual. Immorality, impurity, sensuality. What it is, immorality is, is for simple purposes, it's sex outside of marriage. Fornicators and adulterers, Hebrews 13, God will judge. Sexuality is given in the Bible for two great reasons. One, it, is, it, it puts a seal upon the union, the, the emotional, spiritual, domestic, financial union 
that a couple makes. It's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a help. And you come together physically. And at some point, the sperm and the egg come together and you've got humans that look like you both. You're, you're playing God in a sense. You're, you're not creating something out of nothing, but you're making something out of something that God has given us seed. And so that is sexuality. Outside of marriage, it now becomes immorality, impurity. It becomes a defiled thing. Hebrews 13, keep the marriage bed undefiled for fornicators and adulterers God will judge. And he said to the Corinthians, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and in the spirit of our God. Aren't we glad? Paul said, you were a violator, but God saved you. And so it is, and it's called sensuality. It goes from immorality that now sex is something other than it's meant to be. And now it becomes sensuality. Sensuality means that there is no spiritual dimension to the sex. That is simply a sensual, fleshly thing that is alienated from its purpose of the final act of union before one of you commits or both of you commit that I will be, for when you get married, one of you, the last thing that they're ever going to see is the face of the other. That I am committed to you until I die. That's the way it's supposed to be. And sexuality brings you together. Now you're saying, man, sex is intended for a man and a woman within marriage and no other until one dies? Yeah. Yeah. The Bible's not unclear on that. You say that's old fashioned. Anything that God says is old fashioned because he's eternal. And it's the way he intended things to be. Uh, does our country take a different stance on this today? Is it because the Bible changed? The country changed. And people simply have their finger in the wind. It's interesting that I would have said the first act of the flesh would have been idolatry. Changing who God is. But it's immorality. Because sexuality is the only sin you can do. That here it is sin after marriage, it is a divine and a holy thing and a good thing, that you don't refuse each other. And so this thing of reproduction and of intimacy and of enjoyment, when it's done out of context, you take this normative drive and you satisfy it in a wrong way. That's why I think that it's used first, because this is the first area that goes generally in a human being, is sexuality. There is no culture out there that does not struggle in some sense with this drive that God puts in us. It is a divine drive. It is one that is extreme. It is only physical pain will exceed it in sensuality. It is extreme, quick, relatively quick pleasure that results in the highest uh, act of a human being, and that's the reproduction of another human being. And so God rigs this to ensure the continuity of the race. And it is true in butterflies and lions, tigers, and bears, and in humans that God rigs it that this is the mating instinct. A sockeyed salmon will go upstream to where he was born, cast his seed, and die to get there. And so God puts something in us. That's why if you're deer hunting, you go out at mating season. You put out musk or you put rattle antlers and a deer will say, who cares about death? I got a mate. All right. You're like humans. So it ensures the continuity of the race. And without God, without that commitment, there is a disconnect. Now it is merely an orgasmic experience. It is a highly physical thing. Y'all remember the sexual revolution where you took sex outside of marriage, man and a woman, total commitment, and you made it something you could do at any time, get rid of your mate and go for another one, uh, man and a woman, man and a man, woman and a woman. Was it because the Bible changed? No. Men changed. They say, and you know who they are, they're never wrong. 
But they say that a big change came with the invention of the pill. And it wasn't simply that it gave married couples a chance for, for family planning. But now you could separate sex from the possibility of reproduction. And now it tended to eradicate the divine intention. And it simply became an act of the freedom of man for pure physical pleasure. And it slowly began to work backwards. Don't email me and say, you're against birth control pills. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it got to be something that now you could have sex outside of marriage and didn't have to worry. You could have it anytime you wanted to, and you didn't have to worry about kids. You could just have the sensual pleasure. Now, what I've noticed is that in marriage, if a couple is having sex before marriage, they, it's like building a fire on lighter fluid. You build a fire on lighter fluid, it has an immediate combustion, but it's not substantial and it's an illusion and it goes down. When you have sex outside of marriage, there is on a, on a sensory scale of one to 10, sex outside of marriage is like a 12. You look good, you smell good, you go out to eat, you're feeling excited and all of a sudden, man, there's sex in the bed, in the carport, on the chandelier, on every place. Everybody just goes crazy. All right. And now you build that without commitment. And then once you get married, sex doesn't happen like that anymore. Are you single? Write this down. It doesn't happen like that anymore. Now it becomes not a combustion, but it becomes a discipline that you send signals during the day. Hey, see you tonight about 12 and maybe we'll, you know, what do you say? I'm with you. And sex occurs. You put the kids down, you brush your teeth, you floss. Put on something other than that red burlap robe that you wear normally, <laughs> and things happen. And it becomes a discipline. And if you want to have great sex at 10, you can't insult your mate at 9.30. <laughs> All you men are going, why? Why, what's the problem? <laughs> See, it becomes a, a spiritual thing, a discipline. And when you put the, the cart before the horse, What's going to happen? It's going to become merely sensual. And then in marriage, after about seven months, it's going to cool off. And the necessary muscles to make it go have been neglected. And you and your mate are going to have a come to Jesus meeting on conduct that incites passion. Only a Christian can make love like you should. And that's where you become a tender man and a sensitive woman. Now, sexuality is a possibility that is enjoyable. And so that's why if I see, if I was an atheist, only living on what I could observe, I would tell you, don't get into heavy debt. If I was an atheist, I would say debt preoccupies you. If you want to pay on something, make sure you can pay on it, but don't get into debt. Heavy debt. Number two, don't be bitter. I've never met a happy, bitter person. I never have. I've never met a happy, bitter person. They're always reliving that pain and looking for a chance to get at you. It'll make you self-righteous because you've got to believe that you never do stuff like that. And then I would say, don't get into sex before marriage. Because if you do, you're going to have it. It's going to come to a halt and you're going to have to have a come to Jesus meeting. Or somebody on the outside is going to have to get you together and talk about genteel conduct to the opposite sex that makes sex a possibility. All right. I feel better. Let's move on right here. And so in verse 19, immorality, impurity, and sensuality. And now in verse 19 or 20, we have idolatry. I would have put idolatry first, but it's not. Man gets into sin and now he will make God what he wants him to be. He won't have a God that's the God of the Bible, that is a holy God before whom you trust, obey, repent before. He doesn't want that God. He won't stay atheist because man doesn't do good as an atheist. He doesn't like being a cosmic orphan. So he will have a God that he hopes gives him the answers of who he is, but he can't have a holy God. 
And so man will now become an idolater. He will make God into what he wants him to be. Uh, It becomes misleading and then it becomes destructive to a culture. And that is why cultures that do not have the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that is infinite and personal, that is unity and diversity, that has revealed himself in time and space and in history through the coming of Jesus Christ, calling us to a holy life and a final judgment of sin and the rewarding of faith and trust, uh, that country will become atheistic. No man is naturally an atheist. You've got to send them to college to make him an atheist. Man is not a natural atheist. But if he becomes atheistic, he will become in time barbaric. And if he becomes idolatrous, at times he will become third world, that the culture just goes apart hygienically, industrially, economically, morally, domestically, and in every other way. Uh, We have a great privilege in being in a culture that honors man in the image of God from the womb on, Uh, and the dignity of man in death, the dignity of woman, the dignity of man, those are all Christian uh, uh, residue. They're Judaic residue. And when you get out of that, now you have entered into a Stephen King horror novel. You go into the darkness, the heart of darkness, where you don't have God. And so idolatry, what's the commandments? You will have no other gods, one supreme being, and you will not make an image. You will not make me an aspect of creation that you think I am to the neglect of all of the others. This God is infinite. He is omnipresent. He is uh, omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is all good. You will not make an idol, and then you will not take his name in vain because he is the God of the Bible. He is Yahweh, the God of Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you will remember the the Sabbath because he's the God of creation. And so the Jew always recognized the seventh day that God was finished with the creation. He is the sovereign creator. And now you look to the one that teaches you these things. Honor your father and mother. Do what they say. And then once you get that down, God and the communicators of parents that are the ultimate educators. Amen? Schools can throw something in on the outside. Churches do too, but the family has to be the educational mode and locus. Now, your neighbor, don't take his life, his wife, his reputation, don't take his possessions. Treat him right. And then as far as life, don't put anything ahead of God. Don't covet. Isn't that good? 10 sentences. God, parents, the home, Man and life, you got it done. Well, in verse 20, now that we have idols, don't do it. Now we have the seeking to connect or to manipulate that God. And it's called sorcery. How many of you remember Mickey Mouse and the sorcerer's apprentice? Wasn't that Mickey Mouse? Yeah. To where he's trying to manipulate nature. Uh, sorcery is when you have a shaman, a witch doctor, voodoo, California, (laughs) Austin, where you're going to have to find some means to connect with the deity or to manipulate that deity. Now, in Christianity, do we have a means to connect with the deity? It's called Jesus. It's called the Word. Do we have a way to experience Him? It's called the Holy Spirit and the love of God. Uh, Do we have a way to access him? It is called faith and the word. But those are all God reaching down to us. Do we have a way to, in a sense, have a sense of control? It's called prayer, where you can voice your concerns. When you don't have that, you have to find a way of manipulating deity. That's sorcery. It's funny, but you know what the word sorcery is in Greek? It's the word pharmakia, pharmacy. Because often, the way that you would manipulate the deity, the way that you would get up to that realm was by drugs. You would chew peyote, you would chew cocoa beans, you would, help me out, some 60s guys, you don't remember how else you'd do it. You'd find a way uh, 
to try to reach a spiritual realm. As a matter of fact, when drugs were first started in the 50s and 60s, they weren't recreational for fun. They were philosophic. That we couldn't find ultimate meaning within rationalism or empiricism. We didn't believe the Bible. Thank you, liberalism. And so what we did, we tried to have a, have a cosmic consciousness that went beyond reason to where you would drop acid, you would smoke whatever, and you would, what did we call it? You would take a trip. You'd get outside yourself. And so that was the original purpose of drugs. It was philosophic and religious. It also made you crazy. All right. And so sorcery. We don't use different methods to try to appropriate God. We let him come down to us. And then you've got now verse 20. Now let's get into human beings. We've gotten, we've dealt with God. We've dealt with the apprehension of God. Now the next one is called enmities. These are when you have to deal with humans. And there are humans, enmity is resentment where you get next to a human being and you hate him because he does something you don't like. And you have within your heart this boil that begins to form into a pus-laden thing. And soon as you poke it, something now comes out. Be angry, but do not sin. Ephesians 4, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't sit and replay this thing. I heard a guy that, remember Chuck Colson, Watergate? There was a guy that used to hate him within politics. And he said he would sit sometimes and think on Colson and he would enjoy the hatred like sipping a good brandy. You ever hated anybody like that? It's where you just sit and imagine what you'd like to do with them. That's enmity. Uh, and this is why I say that I've never seen happy, bitter people. I really hadn't because you're always replaying it. Sometimes I'll do that and I'll start talking to myself. You ever do that? I like to take a hammer and just, and my wife will go and tell me, who are you killing? She hear me talking. So I learned you got to do it in the shower and you can't be talking up. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Okay. That's enmity. Anybody got anybody you really do not like without pointing or anything? We all do. Somebody is going to rub us the wrong way. Well, what does the Bible say? Do not take your, it's in the Bible. Do not take your own revenge. Leave room for the wrath of God. For it's written, vengeance is mine. I'll repay. Joseph's brothers came to him after Jacob died. And they said, now that daddy's dead, you're not going to kill us for what we did to you. Remember what Joseph said? Am I God? That's not my job. Enmity, when you poke it, it comes out in verse 20 to what is called strife. It means that you now begin to act out your anger on somebody else. In other words, you play God. I want you hurt. I would like a meteor to hit you. You know what? You know there's only been one meteor that's ever hit a human being that he lived. I just want to let you know. In case you're wondering about it, it's only happened once. It was in Sylacauga, Alabama. A meteorite went right through a house and hit a woman in the buttock. It was laying in the bed. And uh, that's the only time that a meteorite has ever hit somebody. So if you're really hoping that will happen, it's probably not going to happen. You know who else was born in Sylacauga, Alabama? Jim Neighbors. That's where the term surprise, surprise <laughs> came from. When a meteor at Shazam came right through the roof. Let's keep going. Strife is when you are done wrong and you're just waiting for their name to come up and you will mug them from behind or you'll do like we do. We'll ask for prayer requests. Why do you want to pray for that guy? I'll tell you. 
You know, when I was at Dallas Seminary, one time Mel and I were in the placement office. But do you remember Bob Sostrom? Okay, he was the placement guy. And he would put the graduates, find, try to find a place for him. And Mel pointed to his desk and he had a big stack of resumes. He said, Bob, what are those? And Sostrom said, those are the THMs that I can't place. Now, Dallas THM does 124 hours of Hebrew and Greek for three years and the like. It's the hardest degree that is out there. And he couldn't place them. And Mel said, why? Are they, did they fail their theology? He said, oh, no. He said, they're brilliant. Are they not good preaching? No, some of them are really good communicators. Well, why can't you place them? They can't get along with humans. They can't tolerate people. They do well on books and ideas. They just don't like people. They have no ability to flex. They're bad listeners and they're going to have their own way and they will go into a church and crater it. And Mel said, what do they do then? They come back to seminary and they get a doctorate and they go hide in the carol in the library and peek out over it and then go back until they graduate and then they go out and crater again. Mel said, what do they do then? They come back to seminary to teach. And you just have this inbreeding of these guys that simply can't tolerate humans. You ever notice with Jesus, he's never alone unless he means to be alone. In the early morning when it was still dark, he arose, went out to a lonely place and was praying. He slipped away as was his custom into the wilderness. He went up to the mountain to pray. He withdraw to get to Gethsemane as was his custom. He's always has to get alone with God because everybody is drawn to him like moths to a flame. No man spake as this man. Jesus, here's my baby. Could you take him? Take my baby. Take my baby. Get them kids out of here. Don't do that, Peter. Bring the children to me. Uh, Lord, Messiah, son of David, have mercy on me. The blind man falls at his feet. The woman breaks up the meal coming in to weep upon his feet and anoint them. Christ is always, people are coming constantly to him because they're fascinated at him. Because he was truly the Holy One of God. And he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. They loved him. So the idea of being devoted to God and not able to love your fellow man, that's, a, that's an alien concept. It's a pagan concept. That somehow the more spiritual you are, the more removed you are from humanity. Wrong. And so, matter of fact, John Paul Sartre, the atheist, he once said, hell is others. That was hell. It was other human beings that you had to st stop your lifestyle and conform to their well-being. Hell is others. That's what he thought. Are you with me so far? Everybody feel bad? Let's continue. Verse 20, you have enmities and then it shows itself in strife and then jealousy. It's a discontent at that other guy's success. I don't want him happy. I almost stumbled, Psalm 73, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. There are no pains in their death. It is wrong for that person to be happy. That's called jealousy. And then in verse 20, what happens then? The boil erupts into outburst of anger. That's where you seek to play God. You need to be punished. Whenever you get mad at somebody, it's always because you have an outraged sense of the holiness of God. We were at a red light and he sat through the green. He should have been aware of his fellow man. I hate you. Can you see me in the rear view? All right. That's whenever your mate says something that is not, you think, appropriate to marriage. And there is an explosion of punishment. You know, when I was a kid, you remember whenever you try to talk about school, you'd say, I did real good in recess and in lunch. Remember that? You know what I came to find out? That those are the most important things you do in school is recess and lunch. Can you remember all of your botany and biological training? No. A good student times the forgetfulness 
to be after the test. A bad student forgets before the test, but we all forget. But can you mess up your life because of an inability of recess and lunch? You can. Remember they put on your report card, works and plays well with others? That's key in life. And so, outburst of anger. When I have been done wrong, and I will now seek to punish that person. And then in verse 20, it produces something. It produces disputes. That's where the anger now takes the other person, turns on me. And now we have a disputation of opinions and a seeking of justification. We have anger in the church, in the neighborhood, in the business, and in the home. And then it goes to verse 20, dissension. That's where we have a division. People start taking sides. And then in verse 20, you have factions. And that is where the opposing sides harden, they calcify, and they emerge. Uh, You ever seen a football team destroy itself because of factions? If you get a prima donna on your football team, he'll ruin it because he divides the team. Uh, Can it ever happen in a church where stuff is not forgiven and reconciliation doesn't come? Can it ever happen in a home that you separate and you have Isaac and Esau against Jacob and Rebekah? Can that ever happen? It can. A house divided cannot stand. My son was in the military. He was in the army infantry. And he said that in the military, you got all these young guys and you put them together in barracks. You put them together in dorms. And so they they have to live together. And with young guys, that can be a problem. With old guys, that can be a problem. But he said that ever so often things get intense between soldiers and they have what are called soldiers fights. Ben said they should do this in public and and life would be a lot better. It's where if a guy crosses you and it can't be resolved that you just stop everything and they just go at it right there. But there's three rules. Ben said, number one, you can't do it with a commissioned officer. A private can't grab the colonel and beat him up. Okay. That's bad for morale. Secondly, you can't hurt each other because you've got to trust that guy. I've got to have him if we get in trouble. I've got to have him next to me. And so whenever you have a soldier's fight, you have it in public and you have guys surrounding it and the guys will surround it and they'll let them go at it and land a few blows, get it out. One maybe gets the other one down and then you jump in because you can't hurt anybody. You've just got to get it out. But you know what he said, we'll put you in the brig. He said, Ben, you won't get put in the brig for a soldier's fight. He said, what'll get put you in the brig is once the fight occurs, the fight is over. You can't bring it into the barracks because if you bring it into the barracks and he talks about him and he talks about him, what's going to happen to your platoon, you're going to divide and you can't stand. And so if you get in a fight, he said, that's okay. But once it's over, it's over and you can't have a faction. Isn't that good? We're going to start that here at Denton Bible. (laughs) Yeah. We're just going to deal with it. All right. I've had, and I'm not talking out of turn, but I've said this to our staff. We got 50 staff. And sometimes, you know, when you believe deeply about something, you'll cross each other. Uh, Liberals never have fights except over the color of the drapes and stuff like that. But when you're a fundy, man, you'll draw swords because you believe something. And so I've said to the staff, hey, you two, y'all deal with it. You got 10 minutes and it's over. And I've had to do this with Jean Klugart. She and I have stepped outside a couple of times. (laughs) Ann Little and I used to do it. Ann would say, let's go. (laughs) We'd go at it. But once it was over, it was over. And so 
If you're going to make it in life, you're going to have to have the ability of rabbit fur. And so the flesh is going to divide. And in verse 20, then you have envying. Envying is not jealousy. I don't like what you have. Envying is I will have what you have. And that's where now you start getting uh, uh, theft, slander, illegality, murder. You can have all kinds of things when I will take what you have. I've got such great stuff on the rest, but I'm out of time right here. I've got so many good drunk illustrations, <laughs> but we're going to have to wait till next week. Now, I know where you're sitting. All right? So you don't show up. I know you got a drinking problem. So I want to see you. Dawn, you need to be right there. Okay. We need to have communion. You know it. Father in heaven, uh, this text was not really that complicated. You said the deeds of the flesh are obvious. We see it and we instinctively know what it is. And it brings us down. I thank you, Lord, that all of us in here have violated these at some point. Uh, we do not have, this is not Denton Bible Church for virgins, that a whole bunch of us violated these. And it is not a church for those who are always under the sober control of right, of do, who do not hate and do not slander. No, but we're just those who don't practice it, that we rebel at it. And I pray that you'd bring that to our mind, that we have a savior. We don't have somebody that just meets out rewards to the good guys. He takes the punishment for the bad guys, of which we all are. And he converts us and changes us and enlightens us to a new path and lets us talk to him and to intervene in our life providentially and to help us, that you're a good shepherd. And so don't let any of us get covered by excessive sorrow. Thank you that you have forgiven us. As a thief on a cross in the midst of his suffering, you can say paradise awaits you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you cast our sins behind your back. You cast them to the bottom of the sea. You separate them as the east is from the west. You are a good, kind God. And you are able to do this because your justice was appeased and the death of your divine son who became one of us and kept the law perfectly and as a perfect sacrifice could die for what he did not do and as such could rise from the dead and justify us. And so, Lord, we'll come back to that point right now and we'll remember in Jesus' name. Amen.